Hello, I'm Deb Bussinger with the Leesburg Public Library. We are so excited to host Betty Jean Stein Shower today. This program is a partnership between Florida Humanities and the Leesburg Public Library. Funding for this program was provided by Florida Humanities and sponsored in part by the State of Florida Department of State, Division of Arts and Culture, and the Florida Council on Arts and Culture. Betty Jean Stein Shower is a scholar and a Chautauqua presenter who spent 30 years on the road touring 43 states and Canada between 1988 and 2018. Her two main areas of focus over her many years of research have been Willa Cather and Women's Studies. In 1989, she did her first tour of Florida with Willa Cather Speaks and found herself requested by Floridians in eight out of 10 stops to add Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings to her repertoire. The rest, as they say, is history because she got sand in her shoes and has called Florida home ever since. She was named a fellow in Florida Studies at the University of South Florida in 2004, and has received many honors in speaking and publishing. Since 2018, she has been on a journey with a two to five year prognosis of stage four cancer, no longer able to do the costume performances for which she has been well known here in Leesburg and throughout the country for many years. This Women's History Month series will be her last live programs, so we are honored to have her here and to make this program available for posterity on our YouTube channel. Her book about Willa Cather, Long Road from Red Cloud, was awarded the International Book Award for Biography by BookFest in 2020. Her new book, Florida Journeys, will be out later this year and inspired by the program you are about to see. Please welcome back to Leesburg, Betty Jean Steinschauer. Welcome to Boston Marriages Gone South, Virtual Chautauqua by Betty Jean Steinschauer. Once upon a time, before Oscar Wilde and Lord Alfred, before Radcliffe Hall and Lady Una, before Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas, before Stonewall and Anita Bryant, before LGBTQ, and marriage equality. The concept of Boston marriage originated with the novel The Bostonians by Henry James, although Mr. James did not coin the term. His original role models were two women, each with her own household, who spent summers together in New England and winters together in Florida. Mr. James had in mind Annie Fields and Sarah Orne Jewett, who divided their time between Mrs. Fields' home in Boston and Miss Jewett's in Maine, often finding their way south to St. Augustine, Florida, and other warm spots for the winter. He accepted the relationship between Fields and Jewett, but not so easily a similar Boston marriage between his sister Alice and Catherine Loring. It was frowned upon for women to live without men. They could travel together, but not set up housekeeping. The pressure to marry men was even greater for the canoe women of Wellesley, Carolyn Percy and Marjorie Stoneman. Their Boston marriage traversed many miles over the years between Vermont and South Florida. Even the mid 20th century version of a Boston marriage was not easily accepted by society or family. Continuing the phenomenon of all women's colleges as dangerous to women's subservience, Elizabeth Bishop and Louise Crane were wolf girls at Vassar, although the photo was pure Key West. We should pause for a disclaimer. Most of what you are about to see and hear has never been written in textbooks. That's because LGBT history, along with Black history, Native American history, and women's history, has long been censored by churches, families, and governments. This is not a recent phenomenon. It has included the banning of Huckleberry Finn and To Kill a Mockingbird because they told too much about enslavement and lynching more recently, books such as Heather Has Two Mommies and All Boys Aren't Blue have been removed from school reading lists because they tell of families and childhoods some would like to deny even exists.
For this moment in time, let's start with the story of Boston marriages gone south. Beginning with the original closet case himself, Mr. Henry James, who published the Bostonians in 1886. He described the dangers inherent in the cohabitation of two women independent of financial support from a man. Mr. James was alarmed by what he saw as feminist crusaders for the emancipation of women. He worried that his sister Alice had fallen into the clutches of a woman wealthy enough to support her, thus freeing her from the control of her family. More than once they tried to have Alice declared insane and locked away as an invalid. Only when the story came to Hollywood did it become alluring because it starred Vanessa Redgrave. The James family doctor called Alice's condition neurasthenia sometimes, at other times cerebral derangement, and most often hysteria. She was actually suffering from being the only female in a family of five men. Between her father and two of her brothers, she was expected to play the wife surrogate. I'll spare you most of the details. Alice James was not mentally ill, but she did fantasize about killing her father and took to her bed after her brother William named her his future wife when she was nine and then replaced her with another bride named Alice while she was too young to comprehend what had happened. Henry continued to masquerade at setting up a household with his sister until she rebelled upon meeting Catherine Loring in 1873. The myth of Alice's insanity was perpetuated by Susan Sontag, who lived her own life in the closet with Annie Leibovitz. In 1993, Sontag wrote an entire play about Alice James, never mentioning that she wasn't alone or insane, and never once writing the name of Catherine Peabody Loring. Finally, in 2012, Lynn Alexander wrote a novel based on the life of Alice James in which Catherine's name was mentioned 353 times in the book's 459 pages. Let us now say the name of Catherine Peabody Loring. This is Alice's description in an 1879 letter to her friend Sarah Darwin. I wish you could know Catherine Loring. She is a most wonderful being. She has all the mere brute superiority which distinguishes man from woman, combined with all the distinctively feminine virtues. There is nothing she cannot do from hewing wood and drawing water to driving runaway horses and educating all the women in North America. Without Catherine, Alice would have continued to have a miserable life. They met in 1873 when Catherine gave Alice a teaching job in Loring's secret school for women called the Harvard Annex, later known as Radcliffe College. The legacy of the college is still being distorted in official history as being founded in 1879 by a local businessman. Yet William James himself gave secret classes for Catherine's female students who were not allowed to enroll at Harvard. Henry on the left and William, who later taught Gertrude Stein at Radcliffe College, continued to try to control their sister's life. Alice's two younger brothers, Wilkie and Bob, did her less damage. They were raised to be ardent abolitionists and joined the Union Army to fight slavery, stepping up to lead black regiments, a brave and dangerous thing to do. I tell their story because it led to Alice's coming to Florida. After President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing slaves to enlist in the army, there had to be white officers to command them. Otherwise, they would have been killed before they ever reached the battlefield. Wilkie James served with the 54th Colored Regiment, made famous in the movie Glory. That's Wilkie waving his cap at Fort Wagner. 
Wilkie James was left out of glory among several inaccuracies of the movie, but Ralph Ellison paid tribute to him in the introduction to the 20th anniversary edition of Invisible Man. Since I was writing fiction and seeking vaguely for images of black and white fraternity, I would do well to recall that Henry James's brother Wilkie had fought as a soldier with those Negro soldiers and that Colonel Robert Gold Shaw's body had been thrown into a ditch with those of his men. Every picture tells a story. Wilkie, in waving his hat, was taking over command from Colonel Shaw, who was already dead at that point. The 54th Massachusetts also fought at the Battle of Olusti. That's how Wilkie got to know Florida. After the war, he was determined to provide paid labor for freed slaves. He convinced his father to buy a former cotton plantation near Waldo in Alachua County, not realizing that most former slaves never wanted to see another cotton field. By the time he figured out that he should be planting fruits and vegetables so that his workers could feed their families, the local KKK had found out that he had served in a black regiment and that many of his workers were his former soldiers. One of his hired men was brutally murdered for trying to vote in the election of 1868. Wilkie wrote home to his father, I was insulted grossly in Gainesville the other day, and to tell the plain truth, I feel that I may be called upon to give my life for the faith of the principle I professed when I was a soldier in the open field. Alice called Wilkie one of the infants in Florida, but Wilkie was all grown up, continuing to fight after the war for Negro suffrage and safety. He believed that education was even more important than work for the formerly enslaved. He wrote from Alachua County, no colored man, woman, or child in this state is without a spelling book. The whites remain, as always, ignorant, depraved, and licentious. We make ample preparations for defense. Alice James wanted badly to be teaching in Florida's Freedmen schools, but Wilkie was worried about the South getting so much encouragement from Johnson as to warrant an outbreak. Our rear is open to Jacksonville and our eastern flank to the St. Johns River, but our armory is good and we could arm some 30 or 40 Negroes. Bob was not nearly so brave as Wilkie and fled from Waldo after only four months. Alice wrote, he needs a little rest after his hard work. She and Catherine would arrive in Florida, but long after most of the Freedmen schools had been burned to the ground. The nearest one remaining survived because it was hidden in a mansion named Sunny Point in Palatka. Built in 1854, it was one of very few structures of that era not built with slave labor. The judge who built it was a fervent abolitionist. It is almost recognizable in the photo. That's right, the Bronson Mulholland House. It is now a museum and open to the public. Thank you for bearing up during our Florida history segment. Alice and Catherine, both history teachers, would be pleased that you learned without trauma some early critical race theory through the eyes of their beloved Wilkie James. This is the only photograph of them together that survived the purging of their history. Alice's family continued to have her committed to sanitariums in an effort to keep her away from Catherine. Henry was finally forced to admit in a letter to his Aunt Kate, there is about as much possibility of Alice's giving Catherine up as of giving her legs to be sawed off. Alice did not lose her sense of humor, nor was she afraid of death as long as Catherine was with her. She died of breast cancer, not insanity, although she often considered suicide because of the pain. She requested at the end that Catherine read aloud the newest story by Constance Fenimore Wilson, who called herself Sappho of the Great Lakes. Henry served as a beard for Constance in Europe and she for him, but her main relationship to the family was with Alice and Catherine. Catherine Peabody Loring did not let Alice James be forgotten. 
When Alice died in 1892, Catherine had her cremated and kept her ashes. She also held on to the diary that Alice wrote during the last four years of her life. Under Catherine's care, she had no longer been an invalid. When Henry came to visit, he reported jealously that his sister seemed so extraordinarily fond of Miss L that a third person is rather a superfluous appendage. He complained that he had felt like a fifth wheel to their coach. No wonder that in the novel he had the character based on Alice rebuff her feminist friend and marry a man. In the movie, she chose Christopher Reeve over Vanessa Redgrave, but that did not happen in real life. In real life, Catherine began to publish the diary, sending the first copies to Henry, William, and Bob, giving the elder James brothers quite a fright. Alice had never told them she kept a diary. William could not speak of it at all, and Henry threw a fit, finding himself terribly scared and disconcerted, as Catherine put it, by the sight of so many private names and illusions in print. Alice had written, We are so absurdly happy in our decidedly silly house. She could confide things to her diary that she could not say in letters to her brothers without bringing a blush to their elderly cheeks. Henry made such a scene, burning his copy of the diary, that Catherine agreed not to publish it during his lifetime. The only original copy of that first printing that survived was William's copy. The diary was not released until 1934 and was reissued in 1964, edited by Henry James Scholar Leon Edel. In the last few months of her life, Alice reflected on her beloved partner, my heart now overflows with mansitude for that admirable Catherine, so wise of counsel, so firm of purpose, so gentle in action. One of Catherine's most ardent actions was seeing to the education of formerly enslaved people and women. Thanks to Catherine Loring and her resolve that her beloved would have a legacy, in 1980, the Washington Post published an article called Sister of Genius about the once forgotten Alice James. Assessing her place in the family, the article said this, Young Henry went to Harvard and became a famous novelist. William went to Harvard and became a distinguished psychologist. Alice was kept at home and had hysteria. Well, not quite. Alice James escaped the confines of her family. She taught at the Harvard Annex. She and Catherine traveled widely together Europe, in Europe and America. Each time they headed south to Florida, they stopped to visit the very first Freedman School at St. Helena Island, South Carolina. It had been part of Lincoln's rehearsal for Reconstruction well before the Freedmen's Bureau and the end of the war. Now known as the Penn Center, it was too famous to be burned by the KKK, as were so many schools in Florida. In 1888, two of our Boston marriage couples were southbound from New England having as their final destination the beautiful seaport of Matanzas Bay. Their arrival by steamship was noted by the gossip columnist of the St. Augustine Tatler, but first they stopped in Gullah country. Laura Town and Ellen Murray, partners for 40 years, ran the Penn School. They had a network of New Englanders who helped provide funding and teachers for the school. Among their friends and benefactors were Alice James and Catherine Loring, as well as Mrs. Fields and Miss Jewett. John Greenleaf Whittier was a poet and dear friend whose niece taught at the Penn School. He had written a poem to bless Annie and Sarah on their first journey to Europe in 1882. Godspeed. Outbound, your bark awaits you, were I one whose prayer availeth much, my wish would be your favoring trade wind and consenting sea by sail or steed was never love outrun and here or there love follows her in whom all graces and sweet charities unite the old greek beauty set in holier light and her for whom new england's byways bloom 
who walks among us, welcome as the spring, calling up blossoms where her light feet stray. God keep you both, make beautiful your way, comfort, console, and bless, and safely bring, ere yet I make upon a vaster sea, the re unreturning voyage, my friends, to me. In 1881, Mrs. Fields' husband, Jamie, James T. Fields of the publishing house Tickner and Fields, knew he was dying and called Miss Jewett to his side, asking her to promise never to let their dear Annie be lonely. Sarah had no difficulty making that vow. She was 32 years old and had spent her youth falling in love with women who went off and married men. But true love was on her side with Annie Fields. Annie was 15 years her senior, and Jamie had been 17 years older than Annie. As his health began to fail, they had pledged themselves to each other on August 23rd, 1879. Sarah wrote a lovely anniversary poem one year later to commemorate the day. Do you remember, darling, a year ago today, when we gave ourselves to each other before you went away? At the end of that pleasant summer weather, which we had spent by the sea together. How little we knew, my darling, all that the year would bring. Did I think of the wretched mornings when I should kiss my ring and long with all my heart to see the girl who gave the ring to me? We have not been sorry, darling. We loved each other so. We will not take back the promises we made a year ago. And so again, my darling, I give myself to you with graver thought than a year ago, with love that is deep and true. That poem is not found in the complete poems of Sarah Orne Jewett, but knowing of its existence adds to the sweetness of that send-off given the traveling ladies by Mr. Whittier, who happened to be one of James Field's closest friends. How civilized the 19th century before the trial of Oscar Wilde. Everyone loved Annie Fields and wanted her to be happy. She was especially adored by her husband's best-selling author in Europe, Charles Dickens, who did two American speaking tours, especially to see Annie. This painting of her by John Singer Sargent hangs in the Boston Athenaeum. Jamie Fields had an immediate fondness and respect for Sarah Arne Jewett helping her to start her publishing career by putting her first story, Mr. Bruce, in the Atlantic Monthly just before he turned the magazine over to William Dean Howells. Henry James had also published his first story in the Atlantic and hoped to publish many more. He was not pleased to have to be sharing the spotlight with the woman Mr. Howells called Maine's Master Smart Woman. William Dean Howells compared Sarah Orne Jewett's writing with its love of light, sunshine, and living human poetry to the great Russian Ivan Turgenev. Mr. James would have loathed the truth of Jewett's first biographer, F. O. Mathiason's description of her charmed life. Miss Jewett thus found her niche virtually carved for her. All she had to do was step gracefully into it. No wonder James decided to use her and Annie's relationship as fodder for the Bostonians. Sarah Orne Jewett would not let Henry James affect her happiness any more than Alice and Catherine had. She wrote lots of lovely poems to Annie. This is my favorite. Why do I love you? If I told you why, then you would know the secret that was made, the law that love has from all time obeyed. And I, I should understand a mystery. From the four corners of the earth have I gathered into my heart, all unafraid, the friendships that are mine. I gave myself for them most willingly. The life in me, a part of all life, is. One great power moves the whole world on its way. When I am happiest is when I find the next of kin to me in hills or seas or trees that grow 
or flowers that bloom in May, or you, dear love, my Annie, so true and kind. Sarah and Annie divided their Boston marriage between South Berwick, Maine, and Manchester by the Sea in the summer. But winter travel was arduous, especially as Annie got older. They began to forsake voyages to Europe in favor of sojourns to the American South. Henry Flagler's new Ponce de Leon resort in St. Augustine lured both of our 19th century Boston marriage couples. Soon after its opening in the autumn of 1888, it even had an entrance, especially for ladies. Sarah's favorite part of the elegant Ponce de Leon was the hop toad fountain Henry Flagler had imported all the way from Italy. It's still there, now at the entrance of Flagler College. Sometimes the students put cigarettes in the frogs' mouths. The Ponce also had Kipling Afternoons, so named because Rudyard Kipling had once been to St. Augustine, so they held readings of his work in his honor. There were also afternoon concerts almost every day. It wasn't that our New England ladies didn't enjoy the Ponce de Leon, which rented for the rather exorbitant rate of $5 per night, but they also loved to escape for camping trips to Anastasia Island, using the horse ferry to get across. This was well before the Bridge of Lions. They loved their trips to Florida even when the journeys were hard. In 1896, they even made it all the way to the Bahamas, but Miss Stewart far preferred St. Augustine, a city of bright sunshine and of cool sea winds, a different place from the steaming hot, listless aired southern ports, Kingston and Nassau and the rest. She cautioned her friend Lillian Aldrich, don't linger in places like Palatka along the river I think the river air pulls one down, but the longer you stay in St. Augustine, the better you feel. Mrs. Fields was always the more frail of the two, and because of her additional 15 years, they assumed that she would die first. They hated to be apart and wrote to each other every day, using their pet names of Penny and Thuff. Here is another of the love poems Sarah included in a letter. Shall I ever tire of your kisses? I ask myself today, when your arms had been around me and you had gone away, will the pine tree tire of the wind that blows through its branches from the sea and stirs within it its bravest life as you do mine in me? Will the flower that the storm has beaten be tired of the summer sun that shines out clear and bright and warm after the rain is done. Oh no, my love, my darling, you always grow more dear. Our hearts are one heart always now, and I need never fear. This is Manchester by the Sea where they spent their summers. Jewett's papers are full of fragments of love songs and poems she wrote for Annie during their 31 years together. Pretty racy for 1892. Because I am your lover, I kissed you lovingly, and no one knew I kissed you but the white gulls and the sea. O oh, come again, my true love, nor wander far from me. I never loved another girl as I do love thee. Sarah Orne Jewett was an avid outdoors woman as well as a consummate writer. She rode a horse named Sheila, Shyla, and here she is with her dog, Roger. She also loved cats from the spotty of her childhood to a lawless fluffy coon cat named Molly. On her 53rd birthday, September 3rd, 1902, Annie was detained in Boston and Sarah was on a carriage ride in the Maine woods with her sister Mary and two friends. She was horribly injured when the carriage capsized. Her doctor forbade a Christmas trip to Boston in 1902, the first time she had missed the holidays with Annie in 22 years. Annie wrote a lonely note to South Berwick. 
It does seem strange not to have you morning and night. This is the only known photo of them together in the drawing room at 148 Charles Street, Boston, where so many shades had visited and where an eager young journalist named Willa Cather would begin to visit in 1908, not realizing how much pain Miss Stewart was in and that she had only 18 months to live. Miss Stewart gave no inkling of what it cost her to write the letters of advice that transformed Willa Cather from a journalist into an author. Willie from Red Cloud copied Miss Stewart's style, becoming Willa in full fashion. The jade necklace was a gift from Sarah and Annie. Only after Sarah Orne Jewett's death on June 24, 1909, in the room where she was born and did much of her writing, did Willa Cather learn from her sister about her terrible injuries and pain. She wrote one last note to her beloved Annie. Goodbye, darling, with my heart's love, your penny. One year while I was doing research in the Houghton Library at Harvard, I went through the oversized files of Jewett's paintings. There I found this watercolor she had done during one of their camping trips on Anastasia Island. It had, had faint tack holes in the upper corners where she had kept it nearby to remind her of all their happy times in St. Augustine. Annie Fields died in 1915. Fast forward 20 years to Poughkeepsie, New York, and the campus of Vassar College, where one of the great poets of the 20th century, Elizabeth Bishop, met the love of her life, Louise Crane, although they could not manage to stay together. As Carolyn Gage wrote in Deep Haven, her fanciful portrayal of Sarah Orne Jewett's lesbian sensibilities, the polar opposite of Susan Sontag's Alice in Bed, same-sex relationships had changed forever in 1895 when Oscar Wilde was sentenced to hard labor for sodomy and sexologists began to pathologize same-sex relationships. Radcliffe Hall's novel of female inversion was declared obscene in England and banned for a time in America before it became a bestseller. Louise Crane was the beautiful heiress to the Crane Paper Company, which prints the currency of 200 countries in Dalton, Massachusetts. She didn't finish Vassar. She didn't need to. She made her career out of discovering wonderful artists, composers, musicians, and writers who needed her support. Her artist was Lauren MacGyver. Her composer was Virgil Thompson. Her musician was Billie Holiday. Louise was the first to book Billie to sing for white people at MoMA's coffee concerts. Louise's poet was, drumroll, Elizabeth Bishop. No discussion of Bishop in Florida is possible without Louise Crane, and no consideration of their time together is possible without Florida. They tried hiding in the woods of Pittsfield on weekends home from Vassar. After Elizabeth graduated, they tried moving to Europe together. Louise's mother was a wealthy and powerful woman accustomed to having her way. She put both Louise and Elizabeth through 10 very hard years from 1933 to 1943, trying as best she could to keep them apart. There were times when she came close to having Louise committed, but Louise had a brother, Stephen, who needed her. Elizabeth was an only child with a Canadian mother and an American father. She was born in Worcester, Massachusetts, but spent early childhood years in Nova Scotia after her architect father died young and her mother took her back to the family village. She did not see her mother after the age of six when Gertrude Bomer Bishop had an emotional breakdown and was hospitalized for the rest of her life. She died when Bishop was a student at Vassar. Many of Bishop's Canadian relatives spent winters in Florida, making Elizabeth aware of it as a place of comfort and warmth, somewhere to get away to. 
Since Bishop was part Nova Scotian, she knew of a Canadian company running adult camps for the wealthy. They had just opened one on Keewaden Island, just off the coast of Naples, Florida, where Louise's mother would never find them. Elizabeth took the fast train, the champion, New York to Miami. Louise never took trains if she did not have to, and she did not have to. She flew on Pan Am into Miami, where she kept a car and drove through the Everglades to keep her rendezvous with the future Poet Laureate of the United States, Poetry Consultant to the Library of Congress, as it would be called in 1950. There were friends there, teachers at Key Waden, to take care of Stephen. It was an outpost. They loved it. Complete privacy. They could pretend to be in a world of their own. 19th century lesbians often took steamboats and ferries around Florida. 20th century lesbians had to learn to canoe. The lovely woman in the door of the car is Shaw, Charlotte Russell, who helped take care of Stephen Crane his whole life. Bishop put Shaw Shaw, who was a teacher, into one of her paintings. Shaw and her husband Charles, Red Russell, became very close friends of Elizabeth Bishop. They had worked for years for the Crane family, taking care of Stephen. Red built canoes for Ross Allen. Does that name sound familiar? There was no Disney World in those days. The best entertainment on dry land was watching Ross Allen milk a rattlesnake. This is the canoe Red built for Ross in his youth when he was about to star in a Tarzan movie. Sorry, I couldn't resist. So here's how it went for their first few years of hiding out in Florida. Louise would appear and disappear, trying to appease her mother, leaving Lizzie to wait. As miserable as that sounds, and it was, Elizabeth Bishop made the best of it. Growing up on the Bay of Fundy, she loved water, so she swam. And she fished, calling herself Florida's female Hemingway. Some of her best poems were inspired by her time in the state with the prettiest name. But she was a bit like Hemingway, in the sense that all roads led to Key West. Even though Louise knew the time would come when she wouldn't be back, she saw that her Lizzie had a house, a wonderful house, at 624 White Street. With her favorite plant, a traveler's palm, she took in boarders when she needed money. Occasionally, they would sneak a holiday or a weekend together. This is a painting Elizabeth made of her poor, tired love, so often missing from the life they were trying to have together. Louise would be so tired from the effort of escaping from New York that she would fall asleep immediately upon arriving in Key West. It really did look like they were happy sometimes, but then Louise was gone again. At least there was one more reason to live, poetry, and Elizabeth was becoming famous. The New Yorker published almost everything she wrote. Maybe not this one. Letter to New York for Louise Crane. In your next letter, I wish you'd say where you are going and what you are doing. How are the plays and after the plays? What other pleasures you're pursuing? Taking cabs in the middle of the night, driving as if to save your soul, where the road goes round and round the park and the meter glare, glares like a moral owl and the trees look so queer and green standing alone in big black caves and suddenly you're in a different place where everything seems to happen in waves, and most of the jokes you just can't catch, like dirty words rubbed off a slate, and the songs are loud but somehow dim, and it gets so terribly late. And coming out of the brownstone house to the gray sidewalk, the watered street, one side of the building rises with the sun like a glistening field of wheat. Wheat, not oats, dear. I'm afraid if it's wheat, it's none of your sowing. Nevertheless, I'd like to know what you are doing 
and where you are going. If she sounds miserable, she was, and she was drinking a lot, another Hemingway characteristic. But she loved Florida, especially when Red and Shaw came in their boat and took her to wonderful places like Corkscrew Swamp to see wood storks and curlews. She loved alligator pears, those huge Florida avocados, smooth skinned and bright green, bearing little resemblance to their small, wrinkled California cousins. She became friends with Hemingway's second wife, Pauline, and her lesbian sister, Jenny. They made her time alone in Key West more bearable, but she was still miserable and began to drink more and more heavily. She continued to follow Louise back to New York, and on one of those trips to MoMA, she met an exotic Brazilian architect named Lota, who enticed her to move to Rio de Janeiro. They had a stormy 15 years together, with Elizabeth's alcoholism growing continually worse, until Lota followed Elizabeth back to New York on one of her escapes and overdosed there, causing the increasingly famous poet much bad publicity, especially in Brazil. She continued to seek out coastlines her whole life, eventually ending up in Boston, where she taught at MIT and Harvard. She was able to come out to a select few, although she would not allow Adrian Rich to convince her to be anthologized in a collection Rich was editing of lesbian poetry. Bishop told a friend who was helping to refurbish her new apartment that she wanted lots and lots of closet space. Like good lesbians, she and the woman she called Dona Luisa stayed close throughout their lives, often writing or calling or visiting. Louise continued to have relationships with women, including Mary Meggs on the left, whose family vacationed near hers at Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Mary and Louise also stayed close, like good lesbians. And of course, Mary and Elizabeth became friends too. In the photo on the right, Louise's long-term partner, Victoria, stands between Lizzie and Louisa during a visit at Woods Hole. Elizabeth knew she was always welcome there and at Louise's house in Florida. Louise's great niece, Amy, was married to her female partner on the grounds of the Woods Hole estate in the 1990s, bringing the Crane family full circle. Mary and her life partner, French-Canadian writer Marie-Claire Blay, also ended up in the Keys like many LGBT people do. They lived for six years with Mary's former partner, Barbara Deming, who had her own Boston marriage with Norma Millay, the poet's sister. Barbara and Mary's ashes are at Sugar Key on the women's land for which Barbara left an endowment. Marie Claire outlived them both, but died last November in Key West. She flew into Miami from Paris or Montreal each year and rode the bus to Key West, where she kept a bicycle, her only form of transportation in Florida. She was an extraordinary woman, so famous that no Canadian child could graduate from high school without being assigned to read at least one of her books. Few in Key West had any idea who she was. I drove six hours to interview her about Elizabeth Bishop, and she insisted on taking me out to an elaborate dinner. She told me one of her life's greatest accomplishments was being on the international jury that awarded the Neustadt Prize to Elizabeth Bishop in 1976, which she hoped would keep the great poet alive a little longer. She knew that Elizabeth had attempted suicide at least once. Bishop actually made at least two suicide attempts in her life, the most serious in Louise Crane's family cottage on Fort Myers Beach. Shaw Russell found her, and she and Red rushed her to the hospital just in time. She was unhappy in love again, with history seeming to repeat itself. Her young lover was being pressured by her family to marry a man and prove herself normal in 1978, although the American Psychiatric Association had removed homosexuality from its list of mental disorders in 1973. One of Bishop's greatest poems came out of that misery, written in Florida shortly before she died in 1979. One art. The art of losing isn't hard to master. 
So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost, that their loss is no disaster. Lose something every day. Accept the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing farther, losing faster. Places and names and where it was you meant to travel. None of these will bring disaster. I lost my mother's watch. And look, my last or next to last of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost two cities, lovely ones, and vaster, some realms I owned, two rivers, a continent. I miss them, but it wasn't a disaster. Even losing you, the joking voice, a gesture I love, I shan't have lied. It's evident. The art of losing's not too hard to master, though it may look like, write it, like disaster. Elizabeth Bishop is buried in her parents' plot at Hope Cemetery in Worcester, Massachusetts. On her side of their tombstone are the lines she chose from her poem about the Key West Bight. All the untidy activity continues, awful but cheerful. Let's see how many all women schools have been responsible for our Boston marriage partners. Radcliffe, Vassar, and now to Wellesley. But Marjorie Stoneman and Carolyn Percy already knew each other before they arrived at college. Their lives were spent being there for each other as often as they could. At regular intervals, they made geographic moves to be together. If there had to be only one surviving photo of them, this is nearly perfect. There they are on one of Wellesley's famous lakes getting a good start on their canoeing skills. Don't they look nonchalant as if they couldn't possibly be holding hands in the middle of Lake Wauban? Dictating her autobiography in 1987, at age 97, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas had these reflections on meeting her lifelong love, Carolyn Percy Cole. She must have made a big impression because I remember exactly how she was dressed when I met her. And I remember her sweeping the corridors with a wide broom, singing at the top of her lungs. She understood me better than anyone ever has. We were close always, whether she was in St. Louis or New York and I was in Florida or wherever. One of their old friends called them the best kept secret in Miami. Why did Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and Carolyn Percy Cole feel that they had to be so closeted in the 20th century? Marjorie was a feminist, an environmentalist, and an activist on a variety of causes. She fought for the civil rights of African Americans, of Cuban immigrants, and of prison work crews. She had many gay male friends and a small circle of women who were partners with each other. When Carolyn died in 1972, there was no funeral, no obituary, nothing to designate that she had been a focal point in Marjorie's life for over 50 years. After interviewing members of her inner circle, I understand that's the way they chose it, to be closeted in life and in death. But if a researcher, an information vampire, as I have been called for writing a book about hidden aspects in the life of Willa Cather, does due diligence over the decades, the texture of their lives begins to emerge. Many relationships begin or intensify in grief. This seems to have been the case with Marjorie and Carolyn like Elizabeth Bishop, Marjorie's mother had a long history 
of mental illness. It was probably the reason her parents didn't stay together. But even though Marjorie didn't see her father from the time she was six until she was 25, she always knew that her mother left him, not the other way around. She never heard her mother say anything bad about Frank Stoneman. From a dimly remembered trip to Florida when she was little, to the bewildering knowledge that her mother was dying of metastasized breast cancer while she, her only child, was away at college, Marjorie didn't have much familial history to dwell upon. She appreciated her grandparents for giving her and her mother a place to live in Taunton, Massachusetts, but she knew it wasn't her home. The best thing were the books. A complete Shakespeare, Dickens, the Encyclopedia Britannica, she read them over and over. Her mother had sold all the furniture and carpets from the house where they had lived with her father in Providence, Rhode Island. She would visit the houses of friends and neighbors who had purchased their carpets and pretend that she lived there. Carolyn understood this need for a feeling of home. It was a tangible thing sometimes. At other times, it was only a feeling. She felt proud that her mother could play many musical instruments. Sometimes she would hear her mother screaming down the hall in the night. It wasn't particularly frightening. It was just something her mother did. They were so close that she could always calm her mother's fears. She felt guilty for leaving and going away to college. She knew it was irrational, but she blamed herself for her mother's breast cancer. Her father was a shadowy figure. He got a lot of the blame for what happened to her mother, as if you can ever make someone else have a nervous breakdown. It was a comfort to know that her mother didn't blame him. Sometimes she would recall dreamy stories her mother told her in the night, descriptions of their faraway husband and father and his life as a little boy in Minnesota. It mattered greatly to her that her father never divorced her mother, although he easily could have. He waited to remarry until after her mother had died. She thought about trying to find him in 1912. Her mother died right after she had graduated from Wellesley. She had to take care of all the arrangements. Carolyn had gone, gotten a teaching job and moved to St. Louis, so she went there too. It was the start of a lifelong pattern they, would, they always found each other, especially when times were hard. Why couldn't they just settle down together and be happy? Both thought they should have husbands, so Marjorie married the first man who showed any interest in her. He was a crook, but she stayed with him almost two years, even after he went to prison. She had always felt fat, and for some reason always told people Carolyn was fat too, and that's one of the things they had in common. Right after she would say that, Carolyn Percy Cole was a great force in her life. She would change the subject with something stupid. Why would she do that? Neither of their photos ever looked overweight, and yet she would say, she was a tall, fat girl, and I was a short, fat girl. She was brought up on cream and maple sugar, and I was brought up on cream and butter. The results were much the same. Was it all nonsense to fool the reporters? She had a lot of stories to tell to head them off at the pass. She was actually tall and rather slender, much like her father. Frank Stoneman came to her rescue after Kenneth Douglas forged her name on a bank's draft on her father's account. He sent his brother Ned to find her, since Ned lived in New York where she had moved again to be near Carolyn. Or had Carolyn moved to be near her? She was amazed when this man showed up, introducing himself as her uncle, saying that he remembered her as a baby, and her father wanted her to save herself from that Douglas fellow and come to live with him and his new wife in Florida. She was 25 years old, too old to be ordered around, but when Uncle Ned said, here's your train ticket to Miami, she took it. It bothered her at first that her stepmother's name Lilius was so close to her mother's name, Lillian, but they called her Lilla, so it didn't seem quite so strange. And she was a very nice woman and very welcoming. 
Marjorie lived with her father and stepmother for her first five years in Florida, slowly coming to understand that her life had been a battle between her grandmothers, neither of whom could bear their children's choice of mate. It turned out that Frank Stoneman could forgive his mother-in-law for hating him, but not for sending his daughter to Wellesley. Frank Stoneman had a lot of fine qualities. He was not nearly the failure that his wife's family thought he would be, but two things he abhorred, all girls schools and fiction. He couldn't undo Wellesley, but maybe he could make his daughter into a journalist instead of a posty short story writer. Marjorie wanted to please her father. She would work for the Miami Herald, but only if she could throw poetry in sometimes. Poetry can change the world too. Father and daughter were actually very much alike. They resembled each other more and more as they aged, and they each had a fervent desire to save the Everglades. But Marjorie needed her own life and her own house. She had given up on Carolyn ever moving to Florida. She had her own family to please and found a much better husband than Kenneth Douglas, a nice, rich opera singer named Kelly Cole. Marjorie was jealous, but she couldn't help liking him. Maybe there could be someone else for her. Enter Archie the Architect. The woman she called Archie the Architect was also known as Marion Manley, and she designed and built Marjorie a wonderful house in Coconut Grove. Archie also designed the School of Architecture at the University of Miami. She and Marjorie lived together through the Great Depression and gave Marjorie's Uncle Charlie a home. Charlie had been one of her favorite Trefethen relatives. She liked having him around. It looked like happily ever after until word came that Kelly Cole, Carolyn's husband, was dying. Marjorie was needed elsewhere. She rode to the rescue, helping Carolyn deal with Kelly's estate after his death and staying up north with her for almost two years. By the time she got back to Florida, Archie had moved on, starting a new life with a good woman, a botanist named Lillian Fly. Marjorie stayed friends with both, and they even traveled together after the Everglades River of Grass finally made her some money of her own. The three of them took a trip west, stopping in New Orleans on the way. Frank Stoneman did not live to see the publication of his daughter's classic work of nonfiction. He would have been very proud, even for a Quaker. Marjorie Canan Rollins called it beautiful and bitter, sweet and savage. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas dedicated it to the memory of my father who gave me Florida. Carolyn Percy Cole bought the large two-story house next door to Marjorie in Coconut Grove. At last, they could be together. Marjorie's chief biographer, Jack Davis, called it a very nice arrangement. Carolyn Percy Cole suffered from dementia in the last decade of her life requiring round-the-clock care from 1967 to 1972. Marjorie wrote more books to help pay the bills on both their houses. Carolyn loved her garden and loved to entertain. Her house was much larger than Marjorie's. I talked with various people in Coconut Grove who fondly recalled attending weddings there as well as fundraisers for the Historical Society and Friends of the Everglades. Marjorie stayed on alone another 26 years, becoming more and more an icon for the environmental movement she carried on in her father's spirit. When she formed a group to keep a jet port from being built close to the entrance of Everglades National Park, she called it Friends of the Everglades in honor of Frank Stoneman's Quaker background. Many other groups have adopted that name in their societies of friends. Marjorie never traded her privacy for notoriety, but she managed to keep her Carolyn close for many decades. They were always there for each other when it mattered most. I'm grateful to Marion Manley's former partner for sharing details of their lives 
and circle of friends. Marjorie's presence in South Florida will always be felt. I hope you will like knowing that she had a great love in her life. Like the other Boston marriages we have explored today, her story can remind us that love blooms wherever it's planted. Although none of these women would have called themselves gay or lesbian publicly, Elizabeth Bishop did refer to herself as a fruit in a letter to May Swinson, a lesbian friend who was also a poet. Many thanks to Mary Gay and Yoli for serving as a beautiful example of a 21st century legally married lesbian couple gone south to Florida. For more information on these women and others in the LGBTQ category, see the forthcoming tome, A 20 Year Labor of Love. And to all who accompanied me on the journey, thanks for the memories. It is so nice to be back in Leesburg. Um, I remember being here with Charles Pace uh, in 2005. Charles was doing Frederick Douglass and I was doing Harriet Beecher Stowe. Some of my groupies here were reminding me the way I always closed my Harriet Beecher Stowe show was to tell in character about her friend, Julia Ward Howe coming to dinner one night and telling how she was rewriting a song that was all the rage, everybody's parlor song, written about a brave man who, you know, you can be brave and still be a murderer. He thought he was doing the right thing, but he was, I think he was hanged. Wasn't John Brown hanged for his efforts? And of course the song, John Brown's body was in every home and she wanted to rewrite it so that it would be glorified God instead of, you know, some activist. And so she started saying it to her friends um, as a poem. And I, I probably did this, I don't know, hundreds of times, if not a couple thousand from 2000 to uh, 2018. And every single time when I would say, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, usually, it was the second phrase. They didn't even wait because the, the whole audience would start saying it with me. It was the most amazing. It was astonishing how many people knew all the words to the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Even little kids. I did it in schools too. And the little kids knew. Is tamping out the vintage for the grapes of, I mean, right down. And by the time we got to the chorus, I, had, I have an, an audio that, that uh, Butch made in, in the museum in Clewiston that I'm hoping to use someday uh, on in a Vimeo or something. So I'm trying to recreate a virtual Chautauqua, but there've been so many experiences. I mean, being in the Nebraska State Capitol for both the 125th celebration of statehood and the 150th, doing Mullikau, they're both places. So when I saw Ben Sass on the, um, he was the one who used the wonderful word um, Jack Assery <laughs> at the hearings yesterday. Did you hear it? Uh, little Ben, ben Sass, he's a Republican, but I love him because he's from Nebraska and Nebraska just, they just make special people there. And he's, he was the one who said, judge, I just want to apologize to you for all of the, the, the Jack Assery that's been going on today. <laughs> and of course you knew exactly. And if you look it up, Jack Assery is a time honored word. It is, uh, yes, it is. It's been used for centuries. <laughs> so it's not from the Bible, I don't think, but pretty close. Anyway, so it is, it is so wonderful to be back. And thank you so much, Deb, for finding me. I don't know how you found, found me. I'm, I'm going off. Well, I, some, somebody, pe people find me there. Uh, I used to tour a lot more. I think, I think they're kind of over me now. People are over anyone talking about feminism or, you know, Slavery. <laughs> Thank you. Well, be sure be sure you're on my make sure you have my email and get on my mailing list because when something yeah, there's a woman out in in California who's written an amazing book on on childbirth and all of the uh, the, the high rate of of infant death in this country, this country, 
not third world countries, but so I think she's going to be my first podcast. We've agreed to do a podcast with each other. I don't know if it's going to be on hers or mine, or I don't, I don't have a podcast yet, but maybe you can drive my car. If anybody, <laughs> I've got a computer, I've got a couple. So if anybody knows how to do podcasts, get in touch with me, but you have questions, you have things you're curious about, about this or where is it? Black, oh, up there, right there. Hello, everyone on Zoom. How many are how many are out there? Oh, wow. I think there's somebody, there might be somebody in New Zealand, if Kate's there. Uh, Mary Alice is a distant relative of Sarah Orne Jewett, I think is watching from Ireland. Um, there are probably a couple Canadians. Uh, might be someone from the UK. It's, uh, Zoom is a wonderful thing, even though I'm awful at it, but. Sorry, you're seeing the top of my hat. I was having a really bad hair day. So I had to get a really good hat. So can they actually see this part of me too? They can see my hat. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's a great hat, isn't it? It made me sort of, and then I borrowed a, an, an old woman of the mountain walking stick. So that, because it, it really is hard to do these and not have a costume. I'm so tired and yet I know I know you saw me do Gertrude Stein at Orlando Fringe a few years ago so I've had a really good run you know I've, it's been a really good life and I don't know what I would have done without the the National Endowment for the Humanities um, but some have told me they don't know what they would have done without me either because I was willing to drive all those miles in Arizona I remember when Bill Ferris was the chair of NEH he was in Phoenix at a big humanities banquet and somebody asked him, you know, the standard story, standard question, they asked him about the future of the humanities. And he said, I don't know, I can't tell you, but there's a couple people here tonight who could tell you. One is George Fine, who does Mark Twain, and the other is Betty Jean Steinshire, who's gonna drive out from here, probably in the middle of the night, because I know she's gotta be somewhere up in the middle of the Joshua trees by the time school opens in the morning. And they're the ones who do the spade work for the humanities. So it's been my honor to do the spade work all these years, 43, 44 states and a couple places in Canada, um, dear to Willa Cather's heart, of course. So Wow, Sandra is an amazing person. She lives, she was gonna be here today, but it's, it's I, I don't blame her. I wouldn't be here either, Sandra, but I know it's wonderful to know that Sandra's out there. Um, Sandra, Sandra actually got published by University of Nebraska Press, Press a couple of years ago, her wonderful book called A Certain Loneliness. Um, so look her up, she's a wonderful writer. Well, I was in grad school. Oh, what made me start with this as my scholarly um, progression or a path or whatever. I was in graduate school in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia and I had, you know, I'm, I'm a preacher's kid. My father was a missionary Baptist preacher. And so I had heard enough sermons. I, I accidentally took a, a, an American literature survey course early in my undergrad time. And the first thing we had to read was Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Y'all read that? <laughs> and I thought, okay, enough already. So I departed from American Lit. I missed a lot by doing that, I realized. But I immediately went over to English Lit and, uh, and did my graduate work on Virginia Woolf, which made me want to write a one woman show. Rather, you know, I, I had three different places I could have gone to enter PhD programs, one in rhetoric, because I, I had a double major in speech and English. So I was offered a rhetoric graduate assistantship at Bowling Green, Kentucky, which would have been lovely. And I was, at, I was offered a uh, English uh, assistantship at Madison, what was then Madison College in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And I just happened to be a little bit in love with somebody who lived in the Shenandoah Valley. How many of you have made, how many of you have made big decisions based on that? Yeah, so I ended up there, but one day I was driving uh, Route 50 into Washington, DC. This is back before 60 was built. And there was a little sign along the side of the road that said birthplace of Willa Cather. And she was vaguely familiar. I don't know how I got, through college, I guess because I didn't take any more American lit. But I pulled off the road and there was a little lady living in the house 
and she signed the copy of Zephyr and the Slave Girls, a girl as if she had written it. I went straight on into DC to Second Story Books and got the professor's house. And that was in 1977 or 78. And I don't remember anything since. Uh, well, Willa Cather sort of took hold of me. And I, I had seen The Bell of Amherst by William Lewis, the wonderful one woman show. Um, it's not true, but it's, it's theater. But uh, I, they got hold of me in Nebraska, Mildred Bennett um, told me I had to make my one, one woman play into a Chautauqua. I'd never heard the word Chautauqua, but before I knew it, I had a grant from the Nebraska Humanities Council and a tour of six, and I had to figure out something to say. So I actually had been working on Willa Cather for seven years, but I thought it was for a dissertation. And I learned that night that that was not to be my life's path. I was actually intended to be a, what they called a grassroots scholar, which meant that I didn't have to learn to speak academic gobbledygook. So I have lots of wonderful academic friends and I, I, I sometimes admire them, their PhDs, but uh, this, this was a much better way to go. Uh, I never made any money, but I have some friends with enough money to get me through. Um, so it's been an amazing ride. It really has. I can't, uh, I'm the, I'm the tenth of 11 kids grew up on a dirt farm in Missouri. So this has been heaven to me to be alone. <laughs> I didn't sleep in a room by myself until I was 22. <laughs> so it's been wonderful to be on the road and, and driving around and, um, oh, anyway, I went, I go on and on. Okay. I don't generally claim these women as lesbians. The, the, the question is, have I ever gotten any kickback in claiming these women as lesbians? Because I try, I try to always represent, you know, it, you, you're hearing me today talk about them in third person. But when I do them, when I did them uh, in first person, um, if someone asked Willa Cather if she was a lesbian, she would ask him to leave the room for talking to her that way. It was, she was very, um, and, and the thing is, she didn't really have anything to hide in that regard. Um, it took me 40 years to figure out what she was hiding. And my book is semi-banned <laughs> in Nebraska right now because I wrote about Willa Cather's being intersex, uh, which is what all the difficulty was about. It wasn't actually about her being lesbian. But of course, her family didn't want anybody saying that either. And I didn't. If you're a scholar, you don't go around putting words in the mouths of your, of your characters. And I have been called an information vampire. That was actually Willa Cather's term. She coined that when she realized they were going to start teaching her books in school. She said, don't do that. You'll just create a whole generation of information vampires. And sure enough, it happened. But it's very different from to do uh, what they call living history programs. Then you have to be absolutely true. If Willa Cather lied about her sexuality, I have to lie about her sexuality. And then in the talk back, if people insist, I could say, yeah, I can tell you the women she loved. I can tell you what she wrote. Um, and, and of course, with Willa Cather, her writing always bore out the fact that she knew everything about love. Even though she had never been married, she knew what it meant to love a woman as a man and as a woman, which is just fabulous if you read My Antonia and some of her stories. And the, th the thing about Cather and about most of the writers that I've done is that love has nothing to do with sex. That slide in which I quoted Carolyn Gage about the sexualization of relationships, it really did start with Oscar Wilde's sodomy trial in 1895. Up until then, all, I mean, some of the some of my best poetry in this is is nineteenth century, isn't it? Sarah Orne Jewett's wonderful poems, Annie. Nobody ever suggested that there was anything the least bit wrong with their relationship, including Annie's husband. I mean, Jamie's heart's desire was was to know that Sarah would be there for Annie after he died. Um, now there may be husbands who could feel that way these days, but but most everything as as Willa Cather said, people are all together too interested in, in, the, in the sheet splitting. You know, who's gonna split sheets together? 
kind of arca an archaic term, but it was a simpler time. And so I try to show that in uh, when I'm talking or performing, I try to show that same level of respect. I remember being at a, at a poetry conference out in Utah uh, about, about 10, 10 or 12 years ago. And it was a, a, a conference about Mae Swenson. I was there because Mae Swenson and Elizabeth Bishop were good friends. And this was around the time when scholars had begun to use the word queer as a, a noun. Someone wrote a, a book about Willa Cather called Willa Cather, The Queering of America. And so everybody was queering Mae Swenson this way and that way. Well, Mae was uh, from a big Mormon family. So about five or six of her siblings were there that day. And every time someone called their sister a queer, I would watch their eyes glaze over more and more. So I was so happy I knew that story about Elizabeth Bishop and Mae, Mae Swenson calling each other fruits in their letters. Because it broke, it broke the tension when I said, and it's, it's a terrible thing to, you know, to ask a scholar who's all off on the, I mean, querying is, is a legitimate academic, you know, discussion, but it's a little cruel to the art, you know, to the artists or the author's families who's sitting right there. So first I asked the, the person who had read the paper if she ever found an instance where May had called herself a queer. I knew the answer, but, you know, you have to ask rhetorical questions sometimes. And then I told that little story about, you know, um, I know for sure that, that neither of them ever called themselves a queer, but isn't it wonderful that they could call each other and themselves fruits? And, you know, of course, Alice B. Toklas and Gertrude Stein called themselves of it because that's what the French said. But I, I hope I've never given families that shock, shocked deer in the headlights look from anything I've said that, that they were having that day. Perhaps I have. I am, I am an information vampire, it's true. Um, but I, I try to be respectful. And I think you can tell from reading, certainly you can tell from the Cather book, I hope. And the 12 women in this book, this mammoth book now, I hope you'll be able to see how very much I love and venerate each one of them. Um, and I hope to be able to do something on each of my, my characters. I didn't, I didn't like Gertrude Stein that much when I first started performing her but I didn't know very much about her time in World War II and hiding from the Nazis. And I think about her and Alice a lot these days because they were going through what so many people in Europe are going through now of, of literally not knowing where they were going to sleep sometimes. I mean, this is a very famous woman. Gertrude Stein was extremely famous by the time Hitler came around. And yet she was hiding in ditches and sleeping in barns walking miles to find a hen that was laying so that they could, they could eat something instead of, you know, beans and noodles and whatever. So you, you develop a, a real commitment to your subjects if you get to study them long enough. And it's been my privilege to get to stay with these women for, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years in the study. I added too many. I think my repertoire was too full, but I enjoyed them all. So. Yes, a few of the tasks I've gone through in being an information vampire. Oh my goodness. Well, I, I, don't, I don't completely know what makes you an information vampire, but I know that if you get to a certain level of being probably, I think I, think I open my own veins more often than I open my, my, my subject's veins. But if, for example, you have been to, well, when I first started, researching Willa Cather. Her, we were, it was still in that period where her will forbade her letters to be published. And you not, they not only couldn't publish them, but you couldn't copy them. So I had to go to libraries all the way from, from Houghton uh, and at Harvard, um, certainly several libraries in Nebraska. I went to the, uh, on 9-11, I was at the, um, the University of Texas at Austin reading the the May Swenson and Elizabeth Bishop letters. Um, I was, I was, I, I was all over the place. I, I think I went to seven different presidential libraries because there, there were, there was connections to the women I was studying. It was a wonderful thing for about, well, 20 of the 30 years that I was on the road, I was doing research at the same time that I was touring, which was really wonderful. So I was able to, you know, to plan my, 
my research time around what, what major library was. Uh, I did a lot of tours of New England <laughs> because a lot of the big archives are in are at, you know, Harvard, Yale, Smith, um, uh, Princeton, Library of Congress. Um, yeah, I, I, lo I love the research as much as the, as the presenting. Oh, is that, was that an answer? Oh my. Well, I was just thinking about uh, Marie Claire, the woman that I put into this show just last night because I just, I didn't know that she had died in November. I, I, re I remember driving all the way to Key West. The person who told me I had to make it to Key West when Marie Claire was gonna be there. And he told me also that I had to get, I had to leave my car in the uh, train station in Springfield, Massachusetts and go to Montreal to interview Mary Meggs because she had just had a stroke and I had to get to her while she could still be interviewed. The person who told me to, that I had to interview both those people if I had cared anything about Elizabeth Bishop was, was the very famous poet. Again, nobody in Key West knew who he was, who he was for decades, uh, Richard Wilbur, wonderful poet. And so if, if Richard Wilbur gives you a direct order, I think you ought to follow it. Um, that most of the people I talked about, uh, Red and Shasha Russell, uh, should have been dead years ago. Red was 95. I happened to look up his name in the, in the phone book in Fort Myers. I was looking to see if there were any records to, to see if he and Louise still owned any property together because I knew they had owned four or five houses on the beach and there he was. And I called him up and he, one of his nieces answered the phone and I told her and she said, Oh, that's Charlie. That's Uncle Charlie. And he's right here. <laughs> and so I went back five or six times, at least five or six times to interview him. One time, actually, Anne was with me that time. We were going, it was somehow we got in the middle of the shrimp festival. And I don't know if you've ever been to Fort Myers Beach, but the traffic is awful anyway. And I had a big pot of some kind of flower that I knew Red liked. And we were marching with the shrimp festival. It's the only way we could get through. We had to park about five or six blocks from his house. And Carrie, and he lo absolutely loved it when he heard we had marched with the shrimp festival parades, you know, the floats to go there. Um, Max Perkins, eldest daughter, is a very good friend of mine. I interviewed her a number of times about Thomas Wolfe and F. Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, Desi, um, up in Crystal River, I interviewed a number of times. Desi is so pseudo famous, wouldn't you say? A member of the um, Hall of Fame, um, the Florida. Women's Hall of Fame. Um, oh my, I, I have a book uh, started about all the different people I've, I've interviewed. And uh, I know I'm forgetting a lot, but some really, really good people that I would never have found uh, without having, you know, if you, can, if you can go and talk to someone about Willa Cather, then almost anybody will talk to you if they knew her. And, and if, you, if, you, if you are interested in writing about someone, um, who's uh, pro probably who's been dead a few years and someone wants to talk to them. Fl most of Flannery O'Connor's friends um, have talked to me. Most of them are dead now. Um, her cousins wouldn't talk to me, but her friends did. Her cousins may have known about the information vampire side of me. That may have been why they didn't want to talk, but um, just astonishing people really. Um, I'll think of more. Would you talk to me? Would you tell me your favorite, your favorite memory of, of something? My favorite memory is when we, uh, we saw you in Cooliston. We, we, went, we had been over at the Cookies uh, Swamp, the Corkery Swamp, and we went over to Cooliston to see you. And you were at the little library here in Cooliston, and of course, as always, you were wonderful. But then the next day, uh, Ann and I were going to get up and go on some bus to see the sugar, uh, the sugar lure. Mm -hmm. And there you were down there for breakfast, and we somehow cornered you, <laughs> and that was been an hour or so. Just you, just Betty G, not, not Willa, no one else, just you. Thank you. That's a wonderful memory. I do remember that. It was at the, it was, was it at the Clueston Inn? 
Yeah, we have breakfast. The old, the old yeah, the old inn. Yeah, yes. Yeah. It was um, last time I was there, somebody else had taken it over. It wasn't the, you know, Clewiston for many years was practically owned by Big Sugar. In fact, with you, when you checked into the Clewiston Inn, there'd be a sugar cookie on your pillow. Yeah. But I don't think it's like that anymore. Uh, wow, what a memory. All those, I wish I could collect uh, all the different people over the years. Anybody else have a story? We're going to put you on the microphone, Nancy. You have a story? story? Yeah, I remember when you brought your grandson DJ oh, yeah. to see me. You want to tell that story? Well, you were Beverly Hills. Like Do what? Standing, up the standing where? Oh, starting there, yes. Oh, here? Yeah, okay. Uh, my grandson from Phoenix is a little over there, but he was performing in Beverly Hills. And so we, we were doing. Uh, Marjorie Kenan Rollins. Marjorie Kenan Rollins. And DJ, was, she talked to him, and he never had forgotten that. <laughs> yeah, he, DJ still cuts a wide berth around me because, you know, I explained that I was acting and that, you know, Marjorie used a lot of hells and dams and. But he just never quite forgave me, I think. He said, that's just not the way a lady should talk. <laughs> I love that. And I love that maybe I was convincing. I don't know that I was. He's almost thinking. 24 now. He's 24 now. And he still looks askance at me. He sees it. That's how long I've known you all. So it's. Um, ah, the years. The years go by. I don't have a, a relationship with Barnes & Noble yet, but I have to. What? Independent booksellers. I am. I'm working on. You know, I wrote this Florida book for University Press of Florida, but I don't think they'll ever publish it because everybody's changed the. Uh, you know, it, it's been over 20 years since they asked me to write it, and in the meantime, I, it's become quite obvious that some of the books they've published, and this is true of a lot of university presses. You know, they have to try to be competitive with the commercial presses. But they have published some books that frankly should not have been published. And they're, they're, they're even more egregious because they've got the university press, you know, imprimatur. And so everybody thinks they're uh, true. And it's, it's done a particular disservice to Marjorie Kenan Rollins and Zornil Hurston research. And I hope I'm able to leave enough of a, maybe just a trail of breadcrumbs so that people who care about finding the truth about their relationship in particular, will be able to find it because it does do a great disservice when you know publishers publish for the almighty dollar and they really don't care who they misrepresent or hurt or whatever. And it's it was really most um, disheartening to find that out. So I don't. I'm still examining myself on wh whether I'm you know. I was really lucky to win a big prize for the Cather book. I still, I'm still just agog that there was a, you know, a panel of strangers somewhere who sat with that little book and decided that it is it it, it deserved the International Book Award for biography a couple of years ago. So, but if I want the Florida Journeys book to be qualified for any big prizes or even very much circulation, I probably do have to go through uh, a publisher, a regular publisher. So. We'll see. Well, I'm, that should be true of the other books eventually too. I'm still, I've been too ill for the last couple of years to figure out too much, except I've been trying to, you know, fulfill my obligations to the Humanities Council and, and work on the book, basically. But I, I spend a lot of time sleeping because I'm, you know, it's kept me alive way longer, you know, this this thing was uh, most people who have what I have were dead from uh, between 18 to 22 months. And, you know, when you get a prognosis, you never want to know what it means. Uh, Jimmy Carter got a six month pro prognosis once and he's still here. So I have no idea, but um, I'm trying to, you know, to be, to be respectful of the, the, uh, the Ides, whatever Ides are waiting for me and just do as much as I can. But so I'll keep you posted on what's happening with the book.